All right, so my name is Benjamin. I have been working on a bit of security for a few years right now. Currently, sadly, it's only my hobby and no longer my job, but I still enjoy talking about it. As many of you may know, this has been my fourth or fifth ember where I'm giving a talk about this topic. And today, I'm going to talk about Embedded Device Exploitation 101 and an introduction to firmware hacking. Uh, Max already talked to you a bit about how to make things safer and what the common bugs are. And I'm also going to explain your stacks again, just the other way around. And let's get started. So I know I talked about it uh, last year, but because not everybody could be here last year, um, I'm going to give you a short recap of embedded reverse engineering, because that is actually a very elemental skill in order to actually be able to exploit um, such systems. So I mostly focus on deeply embedded systems, and this means something like smart, you know, smart things in your house, um, be it a light bulb, be it a sensor, or something like that. Also, things that actually need to fulfill some real-time guarantees. Um, a drone um, inertia uh, navigation unit, for example. Or things that are really small, they need to run uh, for a long, long time on a single button cell, so you have um, power constraints. Essentially, deep embedded devices, anything that is small, where you can still measure the flash and even RAM in megabytes or even sometimes kilobytes. And I usually draw the line at things that don't run a Linux kernel. Of course, nowadays, many more things run Linux kernels. So I always talk about how to break things. And the first thing I always say is you need to know your target. You need to dump the firmware out of it because you need something to analyze. Then you analyze it in some way, and then you can uh, start breaking it. And this talk, OK, sorry, let's talk about how you actually get to know a uh, chip. And the first thing we usually do is we do some research. So the first thing is you find out what's actually contained inside a chip. This is an example of an NRI 51 which is one very common Bluetooth and sometimes even Wi-Fi chip. And you just look for what processor's in there. OK, it's a Cortex-M0. Great, ARM is always nice. It has here a wire debug. And important for our purposes, if we want to analyze firmware, we need to know where the firmware is stored. In this case, it is stored on the embedded flash memory. And you also need to know the instructions that you're dealing with. So this makes for some great bedtime reading. It is uh, uh, on V6M architecture reference menu. There's also the V7M, which is even bigger, and the V8M, which is even bigger. So have fun right in, uh, reading it. But OK, you read through it, you understood it all, so now you know the chip, and now you get to dumping it. If uh, your target system has an external memory, like a micro SD card, if you're talking about something like a Raspberry Pi, if you still want to see it as an embedded system, you just remove the memory, put it in your PC, and read the firmware. Sometimes it is an external memory um, that is sorted onto the PCB, like for example, a BIOS chip or some other NAND flash, and that you often can read without desoldering it first with a clip. Sometimes you need to desolder it, but usually that also works fine. Then sometimes you don't even need to touch the device or even have it in your possession to get the firmware. Um, some devices update themselves over the internet, and you may be able to grab the firmware update from the wire using a sniffer, or you might just be able to go to the manufacturer website and download the firmware dump. Um, if you want to go all out, there are companies that do the extraction for you, but that's not something you do as a hobbyist. What I usually do is I grab a debug probe, for example, a trusty J-Link, and essentially use a debug interface to get everything out. And that's also what I talked about in my last two talks, essentially using the debug interface plus some tricks to get firmware even out of lockdown devices. But yeah, however you did it, you have the firmware in hand, now it is time to analyze it. In analyzing it, there are a lot of ways to go about it. Roughly speaking, you can say you want to turn this chunk of random binary data that means something to the processor into something that means something for you. Ideal case, you want it to turn into this. Of course, honestly, that's not going to work. And then it's going to look more like this if you decompile it, because some things are just lost during compilation, especially because we usually don't have debug symbols related to the binary we want to analyze. So you usually throw it in a disassembler decompiler. I nowadays use Ghidra because it is free, it's open source, 
Yeah, it's made by the NSA, but there are some risks to everything. There are, of course, many, many different uh, other tools you can use from uh, IDA, which is essentially the commercial leader in it, uh, Binary Ninja, but whatever else you want. That is static analysis. What you also can do is dynamic analysis with something like GDB. As I said, I usually use debug probes to get hold of the firmware, and the debug probe allows you to actually debug the device. And that way you can actually observe what the device does while it is running, and this can be really useful to find the interesting locations in the device. So now you understand what the firmware does, you are able to analyze it, you're able to look at anything you want. So now it is time to break it. And this is what we are going to talk to today. Uh, usually I just skip over this part because there is something left to imagination, but nowadays, uh, now we want to actually do it. So I want to exploit some bugs, but for their bugs to be exploited, actually need to somehow get into the firmware. So let's talk about how you turn your trusty C bugs into assembly bugs that I can abuse. So Nowadays, we no longer craft our bugs by inserting ones and zeros at the right location on Flash. We use something that allows us to write many more bugs very fast using something like C. So we write your C bug, and usually this is just, in this case, your step cover overflow. As Max explained, we have a fixed size array, and you write something in it without checking the length. Congratulations, you've written a bug. This bug at this point is pretty harmless. It is something in the text file, nothing to worry about. But then you actually compiled. You compiled it, compiled into this binary we saw before. At this point, it's still pretty harmless. I can't do anything with it. But then you decide to, hey, let's program it onto a device. OK, still safe. I don't have the device. But then you say, OK, let's ship it. Let's make it a product. And this is a point where we actually get access to the device. And we can start dumping it. We can start analyzing it. We can find your bugs, and we can actually exploit them. And now uh, we are going to look at how to do it. And already told you how to jump and analyze it. So let's get started finding these bugs. And we, of course, need to know what we need to find. So let's talk about classic vulnerabilities. The first and most simple ones are essentially stack, stack buffer overflows. And usually you just can roughly categorize overflows into their location where you occur. Yeah, stack and heap. And stack buffer overflow is the same example I showed you last. You have a buffer on the stack, and you manage to overflow it. Then you also get things like a heap overflow, which is exactly the same thing, except the buffer you are overwriting, you're filling with more data than it was intended to hold, is located on the heap. Both of them can lead to vulnerabilities. Both of them can potentially be abused. It is just different how you abuse them. Then you also sometimes have integer overflows or underflows. And this is a nice property of C and C++, and they are nice being extremely annoying. So as we all know, um, C and C++ use fixed length integer types, and these are either signed or unsigned. If you do a signed overflow or underflow, that's undefined behavior. If you do an unsigned overflow or underflow, that's actually defined behavior, and it just wraps around. So if you subtract one from the minimum value, which is 0, you get the maximum value. If you add one to the maximum value, you get 0. But this is dangerous, because in this case, we add something and store it in a quite limited data type that only has 32 bits. And then we use this data type to check the length. But when we actually calculate it, we use something that doesn't narrow it down to 32 bit. So in this case, what I can actually do is I can go ahead and put something very close to 4 gigabytes in there. It gets added with 64, so suddenly, full size will be something smaller than 512 bits, uh, bytes, because it's something like 64 bytes, most likely, if you put in exactly 4 gigabytes, which is the maximum way you can store on a 32-bit unsigned. And this is how you su suddenly are able to call memcopy with something 4 gigabytes in length, which is definitely going to overflow your buffer. Then you also got something called format strings. Maybe not as relevant on a better system, but we're going to talk about them. And essentially, the idea is, instead of overflowing a buffer in the traditional sense, you're introducing user input, for example, from a URID in the embedded system, into the format string of something like sprintf or printf. This doesn't sound that dangerous, because all they're doing is able to manipulate what gets written into a string. But keep in mind that 
you have format, uh, formatted specifiers like percentage %u, percentage %x that uh, allow you to print stuff from the stack. And because sprintf, printf do not know how many arguments you actually passed to this function. They just print anything on the stack that is there to fill up all the specifiers you passed in. So you're usually already looking at something that leaks me addresses, which is useful for my attacks. It also means if you, for example, store a key, a cryptographic key on the stack, I am able to leak it. But it can get worse if you're one of the insane people that actually goes against the defaults of any common compiler nowadays and enables a percentage n modifier, which gives you a memory write primitive via uh, printf. And usually you use it, you shouldn't use it, to write the number of already written out characters to a location in memory. But of course, that means you just gave me a primitive to write anything to a certain location in memory, which is very dangerous to give me. Then you also have something called a use after free. Again, not as common on embedded, but very common in things like web browsers and JavaScript engines. This is, or at least used to be, one of the most common sources of vulnerabilities that lead to remote code execution. And this is roughly what a use after free looks like. Usually, it is not as simple to spot as here. You allocate a certain, um, a certain amount of memory for a certain uh, type, you free it, and then you allocate something else in the same memory location. This, of course, depends on how your memory allocator works on how your heap looks like, but let's just say it's going to end up in the same location. But now, instead of using the new type, you use a reference to the old type, which in essence already became invalid, but because there's no memory safety involved, no temporary memory safety, um, C still allows you to write via that reference. And in this case, you override some random data in B by thinking you override something in A. And this can lead to many different bugs because, for example, if I'm in JavaScript able to override anything in any object, this can mean I got a memory write primitive at this point. Then this is all, um, already discussed by uh, Max, time of use, time of check. And one of the common examples you get on something called, uh, like Linux is you check whether a file name you get in as a symlink because you don't want to write those symlinks because symlinks can point to anything. But you only check the file name. And if you say, yeah, it's not a symlink, I'm safe to write to it, you then open the file for writing. For example, you're writing a log file to it. But at this point, I, as an attacker, might have switched out the, uh, the actual file that I'm allowed to uh, write to with a symlink pointing to something like etc wd or etc shadow. And suddenly, you're overriding system files that might grant you more access. But this is a lot of vulnerabilities. It is a lot to talk about. So in this talk, we're going to talk about stack buffer overflows only because they are, can be nicely illustrated and they are one of the simpler methods to exploit. And now we talk about how to find these things. So finding vulnerabilities, it essentially boils down to finding bugs. The difference is you usually find these vulnerabilities in other people's programs. But of course, you can also look for vulnerabilities in your own programs. So one of the simplest things you can do is you just do a code review. Many of you already do that while no one developing normally. But of course, you can also review other people's codes. Maybe it's open source. Maybe you managed to decompile it. And suddenly, you do a code review to find vulnerabilities to exploit. Fuzzing is one of the most important tools in order to find vulnerabilities, both in your code to prevent other people from exploiting them, but also in other people's codes. And nowadays, you don't use stupid fuzzing, which just generates an input, throws it at the binary, and see what happens. But you use coverage-guided fuzzing, which is something you can, for example, use the JTRS4, because it gives you tracing, which you can use for coverage-guided fuzzing. So there are a lot of tools out there nowadays, even hardware out there, that makes these things work. But now, don't go off and start fuzzing something like Google Chrome, V8, and hoping to find a lot of bug bounties. Google is throwing far more compute at this stuff than you could ever do. So there's not a big chance you can actually find these things. Then, of course, there is reverse engineering, which is somewhat of a sub-category of code review, because instead of reviewing the actual code, you review the decompilation of it, you review a disassembly, or to just get a rough idea of how the software works and try to find things where we actually try things at. For me, poking 
at different devices, at different interfaces, actually one of the ways I managed to find the most interesting things. And this can range from something as simple as we have an word interface that says, I expect a fixed length string that indicates a command to, well, what happens if I give you a zero length string? What happens if I give you 512 bytes of input? What happens if I say this message is five bytes long, but I give you a zero length message? What happens if I say this is a five bytes message, but it's 500 bytes long? And with the amended systems, what usually happens, it stops responding to your commands because it just crashed. But often this means, oh, I just found a vulnerability that I'm potentially able to exploit. So yeah, if you get something you want to break, start throwing random stuff at it, there's a good chance you can find something. So now we know how to dump it, we know to analyze it. We have somewhat of a rough idea how to find bugs. So let's actually get to exploiting it. As I said, I want to focus on stack buffer overflows. And for that, I sadly need to explain to you how stacks work again. And you will notice um, this is roughly the memory layout of a system. This is roughly correct and incorrect at the same time for both embedded systems and desktop systems. But let's just roll with it. So you got your low addresses, you got the high addresses. Um, and so usually somewhere at the low addresses, you have your actual code. So the program code, the assembly instructions you want to run. And over that, you usually have something that is data you can manipulate. Uh, this contains um, statically allocated variables and all these things. And then a bit further up, you got your heap, which of course uh, contains uh, dynamically allocated things like arrays, like vector buffers, and all these things. And usually on the very top of your address space, at least in embedded systems, you have your stack. And these things are actually located in these locations for a very important reason. Your heap usually grows upwards. So you start at a lower address, and every time you allocate and don't deallocate um, before, your heap grows and grows towards higher addresses. Your stack grows downwards. Um, it doesn't need to grow downwards. This is just a convention that was chosen on essentially all major architectures at this point. Um, can switch between them, but let's stick with the same default of growing downwards. And we are interested in stack overflows, so let's ignore everything and zoom in into the stack only. Again, you've got high and low addresses, and let's just say the stack is not actually a memory buffer that just contains an arbitrary number of, uh, of bytes, but most operations that use the stack treat it as a sequence of slots um, in the size of the uh, address size or, or data size of the chip. In our case, let's just say every, each of these slots is four bytes in size. And let's now take a very, very simple example and see how this is going to look like when we talk about something written in uh, for the ARM Cortex M3 or 4, essentially uh, ARM V7M. And you got your caller function, which just calls the callee by passing it a few arguments, and the callee just adds them and turns it back to the caller. So let's start here. Your caller is going to have some data on the stack, which we just don't care about. We just care about uh, where our stack pointer begins at, and now we move on to the first line of code. And this just allocates a new stack slot on the stack and initializes it to zero, because we said we have a temporary variable which gets put on the stack, and we want to set it to zero. Now we go to this line, to this line and according to the calling convention, one of the arguments needs to go on the stack, because I gave it far too many arguments, and in this case, it means please push five onto the stack, which is a value of argument five. Now, execution goes to the callee, and the callee needs to remember where it needs to return to. So where do I need to go after I'm finished executing? So it pushes the return address on the stack, which is a value of the link register, and then it starts backing up any registers it might overwrite. In our case, let's just say it backups R9 and R10, and this happens in the prolog, which is not something you actually write as a programmer. This is what the compiler does for you. This is going to look different depending on architecture and function. Let's just roll with it. And you could also separate these things into caller and callee stack frames. And usually, well, always, a function only has access to its own stack frame. 
So the callee does not get access to anything the caller does, and the caller cannot later look into the callee stack frame. So now we are done. We calculated something, and now we need to return from our function from the callee. So the stack pointer moves up again, and all of these things that belong to the callee actually go out of scope and get removed from the stack, because anything, in this case, below the stack pointer is no longer valid. And now, because we had the return address on the stack, we know where to return to. We return back to the location where we called callee, because callee had to push something on the stack. It now cleans up, moves the stack pointer up again, and removes five from the stack. And of course, we return something and wanted to write it into a local variable. So now the time slot contains instead of 0, 15, which is hopefully zero Sardos's calculation. And now we continue on in the corollary. And as the callee just cleans up and returns to wherever it was called from. OK, let's take a deep press and appreciate that we actually know how stacks work and take this AE generated picture. Now, Stack overflows. Again, we have our stack with our stack slots, and we have this code. This is just, again, you have your callee, and it does something stupid. It takes a buffer and the length of that buffer and just blindly mem copies it into its local buffer that is potentially too small for what it copies in. And then we have the caller that calls the callee with a big buffer filled currently with an arbitrary thing. In our case, it's just capital A's. It doesn't matter what's in there. And it tells it for us there, 8 bytes, 16 bytes, 20, 24, 28. So let's see what happens in each of these executions. So you see on the left where how our stack looks like, and on the right where we are. So we call this function. We know, OK, where we need to return to, because we pushed it on the stack. We backed up our arguments. Now um, we start um, essentially allocating memory on the stack. We're just moving the stack pointer down. And because we are a good citizen, we actually initialize it to zero. Now we get to the mem copy. And we just copy eight bytes, which are two stack slots of A's onto it. And of course, in hex, this is going to be uh, just 40 ones, which is, according to SQ table, the hex code of it. And now that we return, everything again gets cleaned up, everything is well, and we move on to the next line. Again, prologue back up. And now, this just barely fit into it, and that's fine. So, okay, let's go ahead and return. But now, we actually now want to write five stack slots. Whoops, we just corrupted all nine. Hopefully not important. In this case, let's just say some more execution continues. We do it again. Whoops, we just corrupted all 10. Still, some more we continue. Okay, now we have a problem because we just overwrote uh, the link register, which is the return address. And at this point, we would expect control flow to return here, but actually it just goes off something totally random. So. This happens because we override the return address with a value. But we were pretty stupid when we did that. What if we do it a bit smarter? What if we say we have a control stack overflow? Same program, but this time, let's say we know roughly where this stack is located. And just for the sake of argument, say we want after our exploit is run or zero to contain dead beef. So let's start writing instructions on the stack and filling and building our buffer that way. So Let's move some, in, uh, some values around, and because we need to need it to be in binary, we just assemble them. We don't care about these two slots. And here is the return address, and well, let's say we return to the stack. So let's run it again. And this time you can see uh, what is actually contained in the buffer. And now that we return, we of course take this address as our return address. So instead of returning to our code, we return to the stack and start executing code from the stack. And because I know that not everyone is able to disassemble um, code, uh, ARM code in their head, I just took the liberty of doing it for you. And we just start executing the stack, and this is fine because stack is just memory. We start you know, constructing the value we want into our zero, and that is a very simple stack power flow where we just use shell code on the stack to execute. But of course, afterwards, execution is going to continue on the stack. Let's not think about it. It's something for a different time. So yeah, we managed to break it. We managed to exploit it. Awesome. 
Uh, not really. Because, of course, you can defend against this stuff. So how to, re to defend against this very simple thing, you just mock stack is not executable. Remember the memory layout I showed you, if you think about it, we only never need to execute this, because this is the code we actually want to execute, this is the code we provide. There's no need to execute any of this. So let's just make a bit of room, move the data up, we have a trust the linker script, and draw a hard line between these. So below the line, everything is executable, it's fine, we control it, so fine. Above that, everything is marked as no execute. No execute is something that is even supported on very basic microcontrollers via the memory protection unit. <coughs> on desktop systems, you have an actual memory management unit, which is a bit more powerful, but for our use cases, this is enough. So, what happens now? We got the same scenario, but remember, we are not allowed to execute any of this. So we go with, through with our exploit, we move the PC over, but suddenly it traps. And as Max said, we as security engineers, we don't care if it crashes. We are happy if it crashes because it means no malicious code just ran. So, awesome, we managed to defend it, but, well, of course, you can break this breaking. So let's be a bit smarter. You again, you have um, your curly and curler, but this time I added another function, what I will be apparent soon, which just says, okay, I have to run that beef for some reason. We again target this unsafe mem copy, and again, we want to uh, contain that beef in R0. And remember, we can't execute this, we can execute that. And this looks already like a good candidate, and if you know the ARM calling convention, um, uh, this line actually means write that beef into R0. So, okay, what do we do? We want to go there. So, also, let's assume it's located at that address. And we also know we can control where execution goes by overwriting this value. So, let's say this is our target, and of course, we need to fill the rest of the buffer with something. And again, there's our link, link register, we are executing this mem copy, there's our stack pointer, we continue on with execution, we return from the function, uh, stack gets cleaned up, and in our case, we return, of course, to dead beef, and yay, there's dead beef in R0. And of course, now execution goes something totally random, but again, don't worry about it. And this property, uh, or essentially this attack primitive, is called return-oriented program because we jump to gadgets located already in the code that we didn't need to bring on our own by just returning to them. There are different variants, you can do it via jumps, you can do it via calls, but the most simple thing is return-oriented programming because you already have a lot of returns in your, file, uh, in your program. But of course, this turns into an arms race. You have an attack, you have a defense. You have a new attack that breaks this defense, you have a new defense that defend, uh, the defense against this attack, and you just continue stacking stuff on top of each other. So, what are these defenses we are talking about? Stacking is one of those that actually manage to defend pretty well against stack overflows. So, this is your normal stack frame with return address, you just the backups, but then you do something, you add a canary. And a canary is just a value that you check when it is time to actually unroll the stack. So, if I put my buffer there, everything is fine, because I didn't touch the canary. But now, if I override every, everything, and I get to um, the return address, I overwrote the canary. And now, when the function returns, it checks this value and says, well, this doesn't match what I expected, good luck next time. But, of course, there's not only pretty dumb stack by overflows, we are just override a whole buffer, but there are also more targeted overrides. So let's leave the canary alone and just override right to the return address. Set it to, um, to 180, and at this point, as a canary will no longer work because we didn't touch it. And this is where control flow integrity comes in, because control flow integrity in this case will detect you override something, um, sorry, you return somewhere where you were not managed to return to. So again, we unroll the stack, and suddenly, um, control flow integrity detects this error and just traps and prevents malicious code execution. So this brings us to a long list of mitigations. You have no execute, as I showed you, you have stack canaries, as I showed you, and you have control flow integrity, which I showed you a very basic version. 
Then you have something called address space layout randomization, which essentially shuffles things around the memory, which is somewhat useful because I, as an attacker, as you saw, I had to give you some addresses where stuff is located. And if you remove my knowledge of these addresses, well, my life gets a whole lot harder. You can actually use something called binary diversity. Usually on embedded systems, if I break one of your devices, if I manage to reverse engineer it and manufacture uh, exploit for it, I can use it on all the devices of the same series with the same firmware version. But if you go ahead and essentially compile a different version for each, binary, for each device or even for a set of devices, or you, after compilation, modify the binary, well, I need to reverse engineer everything. And this doesn't actually protect against uh, attacks, but it makes my life a lot harder, because if you prevent me from reverse engineering your binary, either by making it really hard to reverse engineer things, or you prevent me from dumping it by any means necessary, well, I can't look for vulnerabilities in something I can't analyze. On embedded systems, not all of these are actually something relevant. So as I showed you, an X and stack canaries, that can work, stack canaries especially, or pretty well established even in embedded compilers. CFI is a bit lacking. You need to select some custom solutions for that usually. As there are, forget it. You can't do it. You can't really do it in a, in a performant way without an MMU. So because we usually only have MPUs, doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't work. Binary diversity. This also is not something you get by default. You need specialized tools for it. And anti reverse engineering, anti dumping is mixed. Uh, many chips have an anti-dump capability, which, as I showed you in um, the last two years, sometimes can be bypassed, sometimes it can't. So you might want to stack something on top of it, which is anti-reverse engineering. So this is already my last slide. And what I want to take you away from it, apart from how to break things, is there are many, many different kinds of attacks. And you should always consider them, but there are also many, many different defenses. And you should also know roughly what defenses there are and what might be relevant for your project. And of course, just try not to create bugs. But always just keep in mind what happens after you created the bug. What could possibly happen if somebody finds a bug you don't even know about in your application? So of course, we all want to write bug-free software, but this is just not going to happen. So just keep in mind what happens if I actually manage to introduce a bug. Let's defend against this potentially present bug. And as always, just have fun, break all the things, and just analyze some devices and have some fun with them. If you have any questions, you can either ask me now, find me around at the party today, or somewhere around. And if you want to know more, there's my email, there's a, uh, the blog of my company, and we write about many, many different things. For example, the, we don't bypass the text I talked about, I documented there as blog posts, but also some things like program analysis, the Tim writes. Just check us out, and if you want to know more, just get in contact. That's it. Any questions? <laughs>